Welcome to God of Glory Ministries. My name is Rod James. We're uh, going to be continuing the message that we uh, started last week from Romans chapter 7. The law is holy. We find that in uh, verse 12. It says the law is holy and the commandment is holy and just and good. And uh, we're going to look at the first four of the Ten Commandments today. And next week we'll finish up the... Uh, the last six. So let's uh, look real quick at Exodus chapter 20 verses 1 to 8 which covers the uh, first four of the commandments. And God spake all these words saying, I am the Lord thy God which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt, shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them for I the Lord thy God am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that takes his name in vain. And remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And as we turn over to uh, Matthew 22, 37 to 40, it says this, And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Jesus answered one of the Pharisees when he said, Which is the greatest commandment in the law? And so instead of picking one out, he summarized the Ten Commandments by those two commandments. The first three commandments are, speak of our responsibility to God. The fourth one concerns ourself. And the last six concerns our fellow man. And Jesus summarized them all by saying, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. The first one of the Ten Commandments is have no other gods before me. You know, there's uh, five different words for the word idol that's used in the Bible. And uh, one of those words is Miflesheth, and it means terror. Now, who would make an idol of terror? Well, we do, and the news people do. Every day on the news, there's talk of terrorism, about ISIS, about the Taliban, about this group and that group, and they blew this up, and they shot these people. After a while, it becomes an idol. After a while, you sit around and watch that, and that's all you think about. It's all the news people think about. Don't make an idol out of that. Those people don't deserve your time. They deserve your prayer, but they don't deserve your time. Second word is kalmel, and it means a likeness. You know, we're not to make a likeness of uh, Buddha and put it out in our front yard, uh, you know, or to uh, in anything that you're going to have a likeness of and worship it, a statue even if it's a statue or a picture of Jesus, you know, um, that isn't Jesus. It, you know, we're, we're not to worship those things, you know. It's okay to have a, a, a mural or something, you know, of Christ, but not to worship it, not to go into church and bow down before a statue and, you know, ask Peter Peter's statue to uh, do something for you or pray to uh, 
one of the other apostles or pray to Mary. We're not to do that. We, we communicate with Almighty God directly. One of the other words for idol is otseb, and it means pain. Whether in body or mind, it means pain, sorrow, and wickedness. You know, sometimes you can take pain, especially emotional pain, and make it an idol to yourself. Now, I know some people that used to be friends of uh, one of my sons, that they would cut themselves, you know, and they said it made them feel better. That, that is demon worship. That is Satan controlling you and telling you to do those things to yourself. Well, one of the people that Jesus cast a demon out of would cut himself with stones in the Bible. That's straight from Satan. That's not God's answer. That's Satan's answer to your problems. You cutting yourself, you, you abusing yourself in any way isn't solving your problem. It's giving you more problems and it's opening up a doorway for Satan to come in and make it worse and worse and worse. And don't make an idol of pain. Don't make an idol of emotional pain or physical pain. Don't get addicted to pills because you're in pain. Don't get addicted to wickedness. You know, that word means sorrow and pain and wickedness. That is a, a wicked level of emotional pain he's talking about. Don't make an idol of it. Don't make an idol of it. Well, then one of the other words is alvin. And it means to pant. It means to exert oneself in vain for nothing. You give your money, you give your time, you give your effort and energy to something that is nothing. You know, I, I don't know what that might be for you, but if you have some hobby that consumes a, a grotesque level of your time, and money that's an idol to you now I love football and every Saturday I watch football most of the day it, you know it but it doesn't consume my every waking thought the other days of the week I don't you know it, it's not something that I have that I have to do whether it be video games or, you know, just hunting, whatever it might be that just absolutely consumes your every waking thought, God says, take it off the throne and put him back on the throne where he belongs to be. The other word is eulio, and it means it's good for nothing. All these idols are good for for absolutely nothing. They don't mean anything. They can't do anything for you. It, you know, they're, they're not a living thing. You know, they're not a supernatural being that can help you like Almighty God. We're not to worship Allah or Buddha or any of the Hindu gods. There is one God, and that is the God of the Bible. We worship him. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, he, he is the one that deserves our worship. Ezekiel chapter 14, verses 1 through 8, says this, Then came certain of the elders of Israel unto me, and sat before me. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart. Put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of at all by them? Therefore speak unto them, and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Every man of the house of Israel that setteth up his idols in his heart, and 
put the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and cometh to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him that cometh according to the multitude of his idols, that I may take the house of Israel in their own heart, because they are all estranged from me through their idols. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Repent and turn yourself from your idols, and turn away your faces from all your abominations. For every one of the house of Israel, or of the stranger that sojourneth in Israel, which separates himself from me, and sets up his idols in his heart, and puts a stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and comes to the prophet to inquire of him, Concerning me, I, the Lord, will answer him by myself, and I will set my face against that man, and will make him a sign and a proverb, and I will cut him off from the midst of the people, and you shall know that I am the Lord. He says, you cannot have an idol in your heart, nothing in your heart before God. We are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and all our strength. And if you don't, you're out of his will. Because that's exactly what he expects. And that's exactly what we need to do. There's a uh, story told in Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 to 24, about a rich young ruler. And he has a conversation with Jesus. And it says, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why call you me good? There is none good but one, that is God. And he was not telling him not to call him good. He was seeing if he realized that he was talking to God. He was seeing if he realized that when he called him good, he was calling him good because he knew who he was. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He saith unto him, which? And Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man said unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What do I lack yet? Jesus said unto him, If you will be perfect, go and sell what you have, and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. What the young man said sounded good. He said, I've kept every one of these. But by not submitting everything to God, he'd missed every single point because he'd put money before God. He was supposed to care for the poor. Jesus told him, go, go sell what you've got and give it to the poor and follow me. He probably caused death to some of those poor people because he didn't help them. He was committing adultery against God with his money you know, we, we are seen in the Bible as having a marriage relationship with God. We're called the bride of Christ. So when you put anything in front of that relationship, God considers it adultery by that person against him. He was committing adultery against God with his money. He was stealing from God who blessed him with those riches. You know, the Bible says, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. God gave you what you got. We owe him everything that we have, all of our time, 
all of our wealth, all of our effort, all of everything, all of our devotion. So if he asks for anything, the correct answer is yes, sir. That's the correct answer. He was committing a false witness when he said he'd kept all the commands. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. He hadn't kept all the commands. In his mind, he'd kept all the commands. But Jesus knew better, and Jesus knew where his weak spot was. That's why I told him to go sell all of his money and give away all of his money, give it to the poor. He knew what his weak spot was. He knew where he was going to fail, and he wanted to show him that. He wasn't honoring his father and his mother because he was disobeying his father God. Now, just talking about literally your earthly father and mother, but as God is our father, if you don't do what he tells you to do, that's not honoring him. And he said, love your neighbor as yourself. You know, if you were just stone broke and the guy next door was rich, you would want him to help you. In the same way, God expects you to help others. If this young man loved money above all, what are you willing to sacrifice for God? The correct answer should be everything. That should be the correct answer. In Genesis chapter 22, we see the story where God asked Abraham to sacrifice his son. And Abraham was willing to do it. But Abraham said, you know, to the young men that went with him and his son, he said, me and the boy will be back shortly. We're going to go up and worship. You stay here. We'll be right back. He knew that either God wasn't going to go through with it or that he was going to resurrect Isaac. But Abraham was willing to sacrifice anything God asked him to. And God didn't, God didn't go through with it. God told him, don't do it. I wanted to see what you were willing to sacrifice for me. Same was probably true with that young man. You know? He would have gotten that money back. If he would have done what Jesus asked him to do, he would have gotten that money back. I believe that with all my heart. You just have to be willing Make yourself available to God. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 to 9, says this. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command this, command this, thee this day shall be in thine heart and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down and when thou risest up and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand and they shall be as frontless between your eyes and you shall write them upon the post of your house and on your gates. What's he saying? You're to talk about my word from the time you get up till the time you go to bed. You're to have it written on your hands, on your arms, on, uh, on things hanging off of your face. You're to have your, the word in front of you all the time. You know, you're to have it out front of your house, on your house, in your house. That's how you honor God. Yeah, that's how you honor God in His Word. And that's how you prepare to serve Almighty God. Give Him His rightful place. The front, first place in your life. Well, the second thing, the second law, the second commandment, 
must have no graven image. That word graven has three different words. It is peshel, and it means to be carved, like something would be carved out of wood. Also, pesil, which is carved from a quarry, which would be rocks. And pothok, which is to plow, which has to do with earth. So he's talking about wood and rocks and earth. Don't make a graven image out of anything that has anything to do with those things or any other substance. But it's interesting that he said wood and rocks and earth in these, in these words. You know, we have a, a graven image or an idol, if you will, set up before us by the media and by politicians and by bogus science, and it's called climate change. You know, don't make earth and water and wood and rocks and fossils and air and things your idol. There's people that go out and pick it and riot and stuff because people are burning coal or using oil for fuel. You know, if you're really concerned about the environment and you really think that there's something going wrong with it, I want to put your mind at ease because God in His Word promised us something back in Genesis chapter 8 and verse 22. And you can take God at His Word for this because He's always good for His Word. It says, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. We're not going to have any kind of nuclear winter. We're not going to have any kind of thing where it's going to be always cold all the time or hot all the time. He literally just said that there's going to be night and day and all four seasons, just like there are now, as long as the earth is here. So, we're, you know, we're not going to damage his planet in any way, shape, or form. Now, you know, we shouldn't litter and things like that, okay. But when you're talking about cutting out using fuel that people need for heat so that they stay alive, or t wiping out the coal industry that people work there and, and it's a good source of fuel and energy, you know. Genesis 8:22. The earth isn't going any place until God says it's going someplace. You know, it's not going to be destroyed by anything you and I do. You know, this this planet is big enough and strong enough and been designed so intricately to take care of any problems that may arise, you don't have to worry about it. You've got God's word for it, that it's not going to be minus 50 degrees for the next 100 years or 120 degrees for the next 100 years. It isn't going to happen. It isn't going to happen. I did a uh, message a while back about true science proves God. And... Uh, fake science from educators and politicians and the media proclaim evolution as God. Matthew chapter 7 verses 24 to 27 says this. You've got two foundations you can build on. It says, therefore, whosoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house. And it fell not, because it was built upon the foundation of a rock. And every one that hears these sayings of mine and does not do them shall be likened unto a foolish man that built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Fake science about evolution and climate change and all these things is a house built on sand. 
it won't last, it isn't true, and it will fall. You know, the, the scientists will tell you that dinosaurs were here 60 million years ago, and they know that because the fossils they find in the rocks, the rocks are 60 million years old. Well, when you ask them if they know why they know the rocks are 60 million years old, it's because the dinosaurs are 60 million years old. That's called circular reasoning. It's a circular argument. The one's that old, so that means the other one's that old. They don't know how old either one of them is. They have to start from the assumption that it's that old, and then the other one's with it, so it's that old. It's nonsense. It's not science. Science is something that you can prove and repeat and, and, and have facts for, laws, not theories, laws. I want to quickly try to go through this. I think it's important every once in a while. You know, the Bible says he that comes to God must first believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So first believing that he is is, is priority one. So let's get something straight about science and God. The Bible has a lot to say about science, a whole lot. And it's told us things about science that science didn't discover for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. The earth being round, um, the wind has a weight, you know, di different things that, you know, that the earth hangs on nothing. It, you know, that was 4,000 years ago that was written. Uh, Job, who wrote that, has no way of knowing the earth hung on nothing. He, he was a glorified farmer from 4,000 years ago that God gave a, a whole bunch of scientific knowledge to. Very many things are mentioned in the scriptures, things about different star constellations that they have a, a very strong gravitational pull and another one has a weak gravitational pull. How in the world would those people know that? Because God told them and God knew that. The universe as we know it consists of space, time, energy, and matter. Every scientist in the world will tell you that space, time, energy, and matter all had a beginning. And because they all had a beginning, they could not possibly have come from space, time, energy, and matter because space, time, energy, and matter didn't exist before they existed. So as a natural universe that consists of space, time, energy, and matter, those things had to come out of something unnatural or supernatural. And that unnatural thing, that supernatural thing, we call God. Space, time, energy, and matter all had a beginning. There's something called the law of causality, and that says that anything that has a beginning has to have a first initial cause. Nothing springs out of nothing. You, you can't just sit there and have life begin all by itself. You know, before any of this existed, there wasn't anything here. And God spoke all these things into existence. He is the first initial cause of all these things. He spoke into existence the earth and the universe and the stars and the moon and sun and all the life on the planet. Life doesn't come from non-life. And nothing comes from nothing. He is the supernatural first cause of the universe. There's also something called irreducible complexity, 
which re refutes chance as a designer. In other words, irre irre irreducible complexity says that something can only function down to its most simplest form. And beyond that, it doesn't function anymore. Your car is rather complex. It's got many working parts. A single cell looks to be uncomplex, and Darwin thought that it was just a lump of protein, you know, that, that could just come from nothing. Actually, every cell in your body has four billion little biological working parts in it that communicate with each other and all have different functions to make that one single cell that you can't even see without a microscope work. Four billion working parts. You have 40 trillion cells in your body. You, as an individual, are so complex it's ridiculous. You know, I've said this before, if someone found out your address, your phone number, your social security number, your bank codes and all that, they would absolutely know who you were, where you lived, and everything about you. They would have access to your entire life. And that would be less than 50 or 100 numbers of information. You are encoded with a code created by God called DNA that is a sequence three and a half billion spaces long that tells exactly who you are. No one else has your DNA. No one else has your fingerprints. No one else has your retina. You are completely unique and you've been encoded by Almighty God. You know, like I said, 50 to 100 numbers, someone would know exactly who you are, where you, where you lived, you know, how to get a hold of you, your bank information, and all of that. That's intelligent information. Those numbers didn't just fly out, out of the sky. God created you and everybody else on this planet with a code that's three and a half billion sequences long. That is a lot of information from a, a, an absolute superior mind for every person on the planet. The evolution charts that we all were beaten over the head with in school are completely fake. Every single line on those things, each person, Heidelberg man was built up from a single jawbone of a human being, saying he was one of the missing links. Nebraska man was built up from the tooth of an extinct pig. It wasn't even a human tooth. It wasn't even a gorilla's tooth. It was from a pig. Piltdown man was from the jawbone of a modern ape, and then they built up the whole thing around that. That's all it was, just the jawbone of an ape. Neanderthal man was an old man suffering from arthritis in his jaw. That's all. It, it wasn't real. It wasn't man's years old. It was just his couple hundred years old, they found some old guy skeleton who'd had arthritis when he was alive. Java man was the skull cap of a human. The femur bone was found someplace else of another person and the teeth of an orangutan. The whole chart is a lie. The entire chart. Piltdown man was actually even more of a deliberate fraud than just being the jawbone of an ape because the guy that found that was someone that worked with Charles Darwin. He f took a file and filed it down and soaked it in 
uh, iron salts to make it look older and to make it look twisted and, and to come out looking different than how it actually looks. So they could say, hey, here's another link in the chain. It's all a lie. It's all a fraud. Just trying to dishonor and replace God with fake science. The three laws of thermodynamics all prove the need for a supernatural creator. The first law is conservation of matter and energy. Matter and energy cannot be created or destroyed by anything in nature. In other words, everything you see couldn't possibly have came from everything you see. That's a law. That is a scientific law. It had to come from something outside of space, time, energy, and matter. The second law of thermodynamics is entropy. It says as time progresses, the universe goes from order to disorder. In other words, it started out completely in order. And it starts breaking apart from there. It's not getting better. Evolution would tell you it's getting better. You know, we started from a bacteria, and that bacteria became something more complex and more complex, and then, then you know, gorilla-type thing lived and then started becoming a person. It's a lie. It, it goes the other way. It's a, it's a law, just like gravity is a law. You know, it, it's a scientific law. It's not a theory. It's a fact. And they have to ignore facts. They have to ignore the complexity of design in order to, in order to purport their lies. What do you worship? Do you worship a meteor or a bacteria or Charles Darwin? You know, do you, do you worship fake evolutionary charts? Do you worship the, the lie that, you know, the planet's billions of years old and the dinosaurs were here millions of years ago and the earth is literally thousands of years old and so is the universe. That's exactly what the Word of God says. And that's exactly the truth. Uh, there is one star witness to who created the stars. You know, and that is Almighty God. He's the only one that was here. He's the only one that saw what happened, and he told us what happened, how he did it, and where they're at, and why. Who or what do you worship? Third law is don't take his name in vain. That word vain there is shav, and it means a desolating, a destructive evil, and a wasteness. You know, when you say to somebody a curse by invoking God's name or his title, you know, and use his name or title to try to curse that person to go to hell, that is a desolating, destructive evil. You're invoking the name of the almighty loving God of the universe in order to injure someone. In speaking, it's using his name for a destructive evil or using his name for wasteness. You know, we've all heard somebody say, you know, using the Lord Jesus Christ's name, all oh, cheese and rice. You know, you never hear anybody say, all oh, Allah, all oh, Buddha, all oh, Hindu, all oh, 40 million of your made up gods. You never hear that because it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't resonate. But when you pull in the name of Jesus Christ, it means something. It's got power, whether you want to try to use it for good or evil. His name has power. Every demon in the universe knows that. When you invoke that name, you better be calling out to him and asking him for help.
you're bringing upon yourself destruction and waste when you use that name in vain. You can use his name in vain by claiming his name in vain also when you use it, when you call yourself a Christian and you're not. You know, you're putting up a front, you're a hypocrite, and you know, you want everybody to look and see that you're, you're a Christian, you know. I used to tell my friends at work, Bill Clinton would walk into church holding the Bible in his left hand because the cameras were on the left side, and they'd walk out holding the Bible in his right hand because the cameras were then on his right side as he was leaving. I think we can see from that man's life that uh, he was there for show. You know, he's in favor of abortion and all these other things. Uh, he's a hypocrite. He's an absolute hypocrite. He's having affairs on his wife. You know, give him a medal of honor for uh, being married to that woman. But, uh, you know, you chose her. So stick with her. Amen. You couldn't give me a billion dollars to be married to her. But he chose her. So they deserve each other. You take his name in vain when you say something like you're a gay Christian. You can be a homosexual and repent of that and turn away from that and come to Jesus and be forgiven and be transformed. The Bible says if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things are became new passed away means just exactly what it says they're dead old things are dead you better make them be dead you better kill them off and ask him to help you kill them off and turn away from that that is that is a demon possession has to be no one's born that way that's a chosen sin you know god wouldn't call it an abomination if you were born that way it's a sin you know if you're born left-handed that's not a sin if you're born with green eyes or blue eyes it's not a sin you're born that way you're born a boy or a girl you know you could say I used to be gay now I'm a born-again Christian. Jesus changed me. But to sit there and grab a hold of that and try to put it within your Christian life, no, no one says I'm a murdering Christian. No one says that. No one says I'm an alcoholic Christian. I'm a drug addict Christian. I'm a terrorist Christian. No one says that. What do they say? They, they only say, I'm a gay Christian or I'm a transgender Christian. No, you're not. You can become a Christian, but becoming a Christian means being a Christ-like one. It means you receive him into your life and you turn away from those old sinful things. You leave that baggage at the altar and go away from it. You don't carry it around with you and try to claim both worlds. You know, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. You need to be made a new creature and, and keep that filthy expression out of your mouth that you're a lesbian Christian or a gay Christian or a transgender. No, you're not. Isaiah 8.20 says, If they speak not according to this word, it is because there's no light in them. The Bible over and over and over again condemns same-sex sex. It calls it an abomination. It calls it uh, 
filthy, defiled, it, leaving the natural use. You know, a man and a woman were made to be together. That's the natural use. It, it kills me that the same people who are so big on conservation and so, you know, rah-rah about nature are the same ones that are in favor of killing their own children and the same ones that are in favor of every homosexual activity there is. Are you for nature or not? It's not natural to kill your own child. It's not natural for a boy to want to have sex with a boy. It's not natural. It's odd. It's queer. It's, it's not right. It's evil. Leviticus 18.22, 18.29, Deuteronomy 22.5, all calls it an abomination. Deuteronomy 23:18, Philippians 3:2, and Revelation 22:15 calls homosexuals dogs. And in Matthew 7:21 to 23, Jesus said, "Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things I say?" This word condemns your activity. This word says it's a sin not just a sin, an abomination, something God will rebuke you for and rebuke you for, and after a while it says he will give you up to it. Romans chapter 1, verses 24 to 32. It says, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. It's against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the women, burned in their lusts one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was just. In other words, you want to act like a girl, you want, you want to say you're, you're a girl, you start acting like a girl. You start taking on girly traits, mannerisms. You start talking like a girl and standing like a girl and walking like a girl. That's possession. That, that is evil taking over your body and making you what you claim. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. That term reprobate mind there means past the ability to repent. After a while, God says, I've had enough. You know, I've given you the chance. I've given you the chance to repent. I've, you've heard my word. You've heard what it says. You ignore it. You claim to be my follower and still do this. He gives you up to a reprobate mind. You're past the point of no return. Repent before it's too late. The fourth thing, the fourth law, the fourth commandment is remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. The Bible says in Romans chapter 7 verse 12 the law is holy and the commandment is holy and just and good here God says remember the Sabbath to keep it holy the word Sabbath means an intermission it, it is also 
Shabothon, and it means a special holiday, or Shabbath, and it means to des desist from exertion. He carved out and set aside a day for you. Just for you. Mark chapter 2, verses 23 to 28. says, and it came to pass that he went through the cornfields on the Sabbath day, and his disciples began as they went to pluck the ears of corn. They, they were not supposed to do any kind of work. And uh, the Pharisees, who were the religious leaders of the time back then, um, saw them plucking off grain to eat it as harvesting, working on the Sabbath. So it says, And the Pharisees said unto Jesus, Behold, why do they on the Sabbath day do that which is not lawful? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he had need and was hungry, him and them that were with him, how they went into the house of God in the days of Abiathar the high priest and ate the showbread, which is not lawful to eat but for the priest? And gave also to them which were with him. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man, the Lord Jesus Christ, is Lord also of the Sabbath. God gave you a day to unplug. You want to make that Saturday? You want to make that Sunday? You know, whatever day you want to make it. Romans 14, 5 and 6 says, One man esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. Let every man be fully, fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regards the day regards it unto the Lord, and he that regards not the day to the Lord he does not regard it. Me personally, I choose to serve and worship God all seven days of the week. You know. But we're to take a day away from work and away from other things or all seven days, two days, three days. But you're to take time out to spend time with God and to rest. You know for your own spiritual and mental and physical well-being. That's what he wants you to do. Take time out away from the normal activity of your life at work and things like that and take a deep breath and just relax. Spend time with God and his word and prayer. It's better, in my estimation, to do that seven days a week. Maybe do it as much as you can six days and do it a lot more on the seventh day but fill your spirit with god's word and with prayer we, we've looked at the first four uh commandments today next week we'll endeavor to look at the last six and uh move on to romans chapter eight the week after that so next week is uh the plan is would be to finish up Romans chapter 7 speaking about the law is holy would you bow with me for a word of prayer Father thank you for this opportunity to speak your word I pray that this message would reach out to the hearts and minds of those that are listening if there's one out there that needs, needs you Lord and is not saved I pray just now that they would receive you if there is someone like that out there, pray this prayer with me. Father, I thank you that Jesus died on the cross to forgive me of my sins. I thank you that his blood was shed as a sacrifice in my place. I receive him just now. I want to live for him. I want to live like him. I want to be a Christian, a Christ-like one. Any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Lord Jesus, make me a new creature right now. Forgive me of my sin and cleanse me and, and give within me a new heart and a new mind. And let me begin to fill up my heart and mind with your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us. We'll uh, 
See you next week. God bless you and have a great week.